And last but not least, we have the last session. So the topic is AI and climate change, an international priority at the moment. Climate change is a problem facing everyone around the world. So the presentations and discussions will be about how we can create and leverage the latest AI technology to mitigate climate change and the biggest global challenge. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chair. Uh, Director Kim Dae-suk of Post AI Institute at KAIS and our panel, so with a warm hand. Thank you very much. My name is Dae-shi Kim. I'm the director of the Post AI Institute here at um, KAIS. Um, I will be chairing the last session of uh, today's symposium. Um, and uh, we have actually a very, very distinguished group of panelists who will be talking about the relationship between AI and climate change from a business point of view, from the academic point of view, from the more applied technology point of view. So I'm very, very excited uh, chairing this session here today. Um, why AI and climate change? I mean, obviously climate change is, is if not the, but one of the most important problems uh, humanity is changing and will be changing increasingly in the future. Again, people like Elon Musk keep saying that we have to become multi-planetary species. We are not there yet, and I don't see us actually becoming multi-planetary species during our lifetime, at least. That is to say, we do have only one and only planet. Uh, that's where we are all standing right now, and the planet is in deep trouble. Uh, we did introduce um, a lot of human-made uh, changes into the global climate um, um, systems. Um, and the question is, um, can AI help in predicting as well as solving some of the problems related to climate change? But the interesting point here is, of course, that AI is playing a kind of a double-bladed, so to speak, uh, role here, because increasingly AI and uh, mostly uh, hyperscaled uh, machine learning algorithms uh, by themselves are becoming a major source of energy consumption um, and CO2 production, and therefore contributes also to climate change as well. So um, I'm very excited uh, in having the panelists today. We have four very distinguished uh, speakers. We have uh, Max Evans um, from the Climate AI Company. We have uh, Emily Schockberg from Cambridge University, uh, David uh, Rolnick uh, from uh, University of McGill, and Professor uh, Chung Hiti Chung Hite from KAIST. Um, we will get started with our first speaker, uh, Max Evans. Um, he is the CEO, co-founder and CEO of Climate um, AI, and uh, I'm reading from his uh, bio in his webpage that um, he originates uh, um, from a um, lineage of uh, Ecuadorian pineapple uh, farmers. Um, that's quite interesting as well. Um, I don't think that he will be talking about pineapple farming today, but if there is a link, uh, feel perfectly free, free to talk about that as well. And he will be talking about past is no longer representative of the future. So the stage is all yours, so Max Evans from Climate AI. Thank you much. Um, so, uh, first of all, let, let me just share the screen. And um, th there, there is a pineapple link, uh, I, I promise. It, it does happen to come with agriculture uh, being one of the most impacted industries uh, regarding climate. Um, so it has been our, our beachhead market and our focus to actually try to bring resilience specifically to the agricultural market um, making sure that we are, have food sustainability and food sufficiency. Uh, but I'll get into that in a bit. Um, so as mentioned, um, I, I come here as one of the co-founders of Climate AI with our main goal of accelerating climate resilience in particular um, through the use of uh, AI and um, connecting AI deeply, deeply into industries. Um, so first of all, can everybody hear me fine? Are there any technical issues? We can hear you, yeah, we can hear you well. Perfect. Um, then I will continue. Um, so first of all, the issue, um, there are $3.2 trillion of, of different supply chain costs 
that are extremely exposed to weather volatility. Um, climate change is only making this worse. And here are a couple of examples around uh, different um, news reports um, and different events um, that just very lightly have um, caused uh, big losses in the supply chain. In, in the supply chain. Um, and it is at least a, an exemplification of, um, of the problem. Um, one of the good tailwinds in, in the industry is that both the European, um, the American uh, government have started to um, move towards mandating um, ESG reporting and climate reporting uh, for large industries. And um, there has been both a private and a public movement towards building climate resilience, um, especially because it becomes such a big problem uh, for so many, um, for, for just feeding, feeding the world. Um, so this is a little bit of, of the problem. Um, the leadership team, um, I'm one of the co-founders at uh, Imanju Gupta. Um, so we both of this started. Uh, we were roommates at Stanford University uh, where we started uh, building the initial models and working with um, the, our first professor um, to actually develop um, climate models in particularly for stranded assets, which tend to be assets that um, no longer become financially viable due to ch climate change and end up being abandoned, uh, the investment lost and the economic potential of, of these assets um, destroyed. Um, so this is sort of like the origin of climate AI. Uh, as mentioned, I, um, I come from an agricultural background in, in Ecuador. Um, in particular, uh, the flowering of pineapples is determined by, by climate. Um, as humans, we've, we've managed to achieve like year round production of, of pineapples by carefully controlling the heat um, which is sort of like the driving force be, be, be behind the flowering uh, and the creation of a pineapple fruit. Um, so when there are large night and day volatilities, that means that you have natural rather than sort of like the artificial flowering that allows year long production. Natural production will happen when there will be big weather volatility. So suddenly you, your entire year long crop will flower in a single month uh, a lot gets wasted, uh, a lot can't be harvested or can't be sent to the market. Um, so it happened less and less um, in the past. And as the, these last couple of years, a lot more natural uh, flowering of pineapple and waste has happened uh, personally in, um, in our business. And it's just a simple close to home example of how climate change can can really change um, the risks and the potential wastage of a small uh, pineapple farm. Um, so wh wh what do we do? I, I think um, we like to bring AI and, and we like to build, bring both climate and weather forecasting to the decision level. Um, generally, we, we use a couple of concepts from fundamental um, machine learning driven forecasting to um, ensembling, um, using a lot of forecasts and finding optimal ways of ensembling them um, and connecting them all the way to the decision making point. Um, generally, this means understanding the, the use cases, the pain points and the specific workflows of customers so that um, Machine learning isn't it isn't just a, a data point or, or some interesting anecdote that people can that people and by people I mean the users the the uh, agronomists uh, the the uh, planners agronomic planners in large companies can have um, but we're actually impacting a decision an example can be um, during uh, a planting phase of a specific crop. Uh, you need to know whether um, the rest of your year will be sufficiently warm 
to actually produce the, the crop. So most plants are driven by heat units, growing degree days. Um, so whenever you're planting, will you get enough growing degree days over your entire growing season to make um, this crop viable? Uh, similarly, you don't want too few growing degree days because if there are too few heat units that allow your plant to grow, then your plant won't reach its full maturity and maybe the end of the season, a snow in, um, a, a cold snap, a cold event will happen that will freeze your plants and not allow them to grow. Um, so agriculture tends to be this delicate balance between um, with, with weather of getting enough, but not too much and, and trying to plan the exact timing of planting that allows this careful balance to, to happen. And this is a tool or a calculator that mixes when you plant uh, along with um, how much uh, heat your plant needs, when will the first rain comes, when will the, the latter cold snaps come and try to um, make optimal choices on, under uncertainty. Um, and because um, in the time scales that we work in, things tend to be highly uncertain. Um, most decisions need to be made in the probabilistic space. And there is the additional challenge of um, communicating probability in a easy to use way uh, for customers. And that is another big part of our focus is just the communication of uncertainty. Um, so, a little bit about why, why now. Um, so it is not only the sort of like the advances in machine learning that, that have made this possible. There are a lot of preconditions. Uh, a, a very very big one is the digitization uh, of industries. Um, so machine learning tends to be data hungry. Uh, so it requires having vast amounts of data. Um, an example is historical data of crops and how the yields have been for every year in, in different lots that allows you to build crop models. So it allows you to relate how the yield and the, um, and the output of a specific crop or a specific plant has, can be related to the climate. Um, similarly, as mentioned, there have been regulatory, regulatory pressure, mandatory disclosures of physical climate, both in the EU and in the States, um, and the, the need around uh, climate change impacts and a changing climate. I think people are more and more aware that um, you can't use 30-year averages anymore, um, that often, more often than not, um, this year or this next year will, will fall outside the normal of the climatology and that we will be dealing with um, exceptional years or exceptional climate events. Um, so this is what, what's, what's driving um, the adoption of, of different climate AI products in the industry. Um, so a little bit more about what we do. Um, we um, take advantage of data, of a lot of data, the digitization of multiple data streams, um, be them from uh, the big deployment of private weather stations um, to a easily available sensor and satellite data um, to a lot of climate models, both in the future and the, in the past that, that allows uh, data hungry um, models to be trained. And, and this allows us to forecast in the weather seasonal and long-term um, and, and long-term um, horizons. Um, and on top of that, probably the, the most important is the impact model or connecting AI to industries uh, because without it can't really drive um, business value. Um, trust um, is actually an R&D challenge. Generally, uh, we, we need to build trust in, in multiple ways. Um, but the first one is obviously trying to deliver value in a quick 
um, in a quick and repeatable way um, so that we can gain trust with small wins to eventually allow um, them to trust us with climate projections with, with using the IPCC. Um, you can gain trust by leveraging the, the broader community, in this case, um, the, the value and um, the value and like robust testing of CNIP6 models, um, the use of the IPCC report, how it has been adopted in multiple industries and multiple governments, and then using that as one of the core data sets for long-term climate analytics. Um, so this is sort of like the appeal to authority that, that can help build trust. Um, there's also around being able to communicate it at a very localized fashion. Um, what does this scientific development, what does the CNIP6 projections mean to you? And how can we make it most useful to you? Um, we, we leverage our success in more of the short-term forecasting to gain credibility for the long-term forecasting as well. And it's about um, communicating uh, thoroughly uh, what it is you're doing, how you are reducing uncertainty, how you're trying to localize um, this information to a client-specific concern and make it a little bit more um, useful. So um, I think one of the big challenges is uh, trust building around both the development and the use of um, climate models and AI in general. Um, some other interesting use cases of, um, of machine learning is um, th this is a project around uh, downscaling of precipitation that, that we did in a, in a white paper. Um, the, um, the premise is that there is the need of localizing forecasts and localizing events in a way that can actually make it useful for the decision-making process. Um, one of the highest value um, metrics or information tends to be uh, rainfall or precipitation for agriculture. Um, and GANs actually work particularly well trying to train um, networks to trick each other and to iteratively improve a, a model that tries to downscale precipitation. And by downscale, it, it means moving from a relatively um, low resolution of a couple tens of kilometers to a relatively higher resolution of a couple uh, tens to hundreds of meters um, of resolution in precipitation and trying to trying to remove this sort of like averaging that can happen over large, large spaces to make it more precise if whether on this side of the mountain it will rain a little bit more than on the other side of the mountain. Um, so these type of um, downscaling, uh, historical corrections, has been very, very useful for, uh, for using um, the generative adversarial networks. Um, on the other hand, you, we, we also use like more standard um, convolutional neural networks to try to train a general climate model. Um, so this is the paper behind here is how do you train a generalized climate model? And in this case, we are particularly um, lucky to be able to stand on the shoulders of all of the public governments uh, around the world um, where historical runs of Earth, of just Earth, Earth's physics has been running for thousands of years. So we have like pre-industrial controls of just Earth and Earth simulation, what would happen without uh, without um, industrialization, how, how would Earth have been during industrialization? How will it be for the next couple of hundred years uh, with RCT sort of like simulations? And you can grab these thousands and thousands of years of simulation from multiple governments, from all of the efforts around the world and sort of like put them all together and try to train a very, very big neural network to sort of like capture the underlying physics behind it. Um, this then becomes a 
good um, pre-training base from which you can make seasonal uh, forecasts. Um, and it's, it's worked uh, quite well. Um, in specific, the, the paper particularly focuses on El Nino forecasting um, and notes how like uh, CS5 uh, level accuracy and above can be achieved um, through these sort of metal, through this sort of um, methods where CS5 is sort of like state of the art dynamical, um, dynamical forecasting uh, of long-term climate can, can be achieved with machine le uh, learning as well. With, with statistical methods, in particular deep learning, which is a little bit new. Um, so um, this is a, a brief overview of, of where we are, what we're doing, um, the industry that we focus, the, the machine learning techniques that we do, um, the why and the how of, of climate AI. So we're really happy to answer questions, look into the chat and, and just, not go too far over my time. All right, so thank you very much. So let's give him a big applause. Thank you very much for your very informative uh, presentation. So we have seen in the past two years of a global COVID uh, crisis, how fragile uh, global supply chains are. And I do agree with you that obviously major global changes are going to have uh, major perturbations on our way of interacting with uh, the, how our way of distributed uh, global supply chain systems. And it's great to see that uh, you and you others are trying to use AI or the methods of AI in mitigating some of these problems. And I'm sure there will be a lot of interesting questions during the panel session later on. We will now move to the second speaker, um, Emily Schockberg from Cambridge University. She's the director of Cambridge Zero, which is a major uh, climate change uh, initiative at Cambridge University. She's a professor of uh, environmental data science uh, at the Department of Computer Science and Technology. Um, and uh, um, she's a fellow of Darwin College. And for many years, well, for more than a decade, uh, she participated at the British Antarctica Survey, uh, where she led the UA UK National Research Program on the Southern Ocean and its role in climate. Uh, more importantly, I'm just reading that in 2016, she was awarded uh, an uh, Order of British Empire, OBE, for services to science and uh, public communications in science. So I'm not certain whether I can simply address you as Emily. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so, Emily, and uh, she's going to talk about the use of AI in climate prediction. It's all yours. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be speaking to you um, to you today. Um, and I, I, in many ways, what I'm going to do is I, I give you uh, the academic version of Max's talk. So there will be a lot of you'll see there are a lot of connections through to um, what Max just described. But let me um, start by sharing my screen. Um, So um, I thought I'd just start with setting, setting the scene in terms of, of climate change. Um, and this is, if you like, a dashboard of um, how the world has been changing over the last 150 years. Um, so we've seen, if you start at the, at the top left of this dashboard, we've seen a 50% increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last 150 years. And if we, we move down, um, that has driven... Uh, a substantial increase in the average temperature of the surface of the Earth. So now around about 1.1 degree warmer than it was 150 years ago. And that's also uh, initiated a whole series of other changes in the climate system. You can see um, shown here in the data, there's been about 25 centimetres of sea level rise over the last 150 years. And that's really as a result of two causes. The first is that as the atmosphere is warmed up, the ocean is slowly warming up. And as the water in the ocean warms up, it literally expands in volume. And that has been raising sea level. But also, as the world has been warming up, um, ice around the world has been melting. And where that ice is sat on land, when it finds its way into the oceans, it also raises sea level. 
And then perhaps most impactful for society is that we have seen a significant increase in the number of extreme weather events around the world. And the map that you see shown here, um, every one of those red dots, are there flooding events or um, droughts or heat waves or wildfires, extreme weather events that have occurred just in the last couple of years around the world, where um, there's been a careful analysis whether or not the risk of those extreme weather events has increased as a consequence of the climate change that we've seen to date. And every dot that's coloured red, um, the assessment has been that indeed the risk of those events occurring has increased. So um, the big climate event of the last uh, month was the COP26 conference in Glasgow. And the final text of that, um, of that climate conference really, you know, in some ways summarized the state of the world, recognized the danger that the world um, faces. So I've just pulled out a, a key quote from that um, statement, which all countries of the world signed up to, um, expressed alarm and utmost concern that human activities have caused around 1.1 degree of warming to date and that the impacts are already being felt in every region. Um, and importantly, it also recognized that there's a real urgency in responding to um, climate change and that if we don't respond uh, rapidly, then we simply won't be able to limit the worst impacts of climate change. Um, and you can see just from the last, this was over, some, some examples of extreme weather that occurred over um, the last few months around the world, um, earlier in the summer, extreme temperatures in Canada, also in Southern Europe, but also um, other parts of the world, extreme flooding, for example. Um, there's a significant concern um, about uh, a severe a drought that's occurring in um, Madagascar at the moment, and there's some uncertainty uh, to come back to some of the things that Max was talking about earlier, some uncertainty as to whether or not um, that extreme drought is a part of the, the natural variability of rainfall in the, um, in the region or whether or not it's linked to climate change. So there's a real need, as Max outlined, for information on climate risk that can be used in a whole range of decision making, whether that's decision making in businesses um, to support um, business related decisions or whether it's um, decision making associated with humanitarian responses. Um, there are so many different aspects in which either to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change, we need to understand the risks into the future of different levels of emissions, um, or we need to understand um, how to build resilience to future climate change. And similarly, then we need to understand the local impacts of, um, of climate change. But at the same time, we have vast data sets now um, to help us understand how the world is changing. Um, some of those data sets come from ground-based measurements. Some of them come from space-based measurements. We have huge amounts of data now um, coming from satellite observations. Some of them, um, one of the images that I've shown show, showing here in terms of the data come from autonomous instruments that we have in the oceans that are able to sample the oceans at depth um, uh, uh, continuously. And some of them come from the physics-based climate models uh, that have been developed over previous decades and are now run systematically as part of an uh, integrated um, uh, global effort that's associated with the IPCC, the Interna uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And combined together, that's a huge source of data that we have. And so really the opportunity here is how can we deploy AI um, to help augment our understanding of um, climate, bringing together all those different data sources to help provide that actionable information to support decision-making. So I wanted just to give you a, um, a sense of what the physics-based climate models um, look like, because traditionally that's the approach that's been used to um, help support climate prediction. And um, so climate physics-based climate models, uh, in fact, they're pretty much the same as the physics-based weather forecasting models, they um, look at uh, of rep representing the key physics of the atmosphere. Um, and in the case of climate models, also the ocean and key aspects of the um, uh, in changes on the land, including, for example, changes to the ice. And those um, 
equations that represent the physics are then solved numerically on a grid. And um, that is essentially the, the core elements of a climate model. And some of the uh, greatest uh, challenges in terms of producing those climate models come in terms of representing the processes that occur at a smaller scale than the grid of those models. And so the greatest uncertainty in physics-based climate models come in terms of the representation of clouds, for example, um, the representation of sea ice processes, because sea ice processes can happen on very small scales and involve multiple different aspects of physics, um, or some of the dynamics of the ocean, um, which similarly can happen on, on small scales. So what I show here is um, some of the results from the most recent IPCC report um, using those climate models. And there's around, around a couple of dozen different climate models that are used that are put into these IPCC um, reports. And all of them have slightly different ways of representing some of these processes that I've just described. And so they have slightly different results. Um, what you're seeing here is the results just for two things. Um, on the top is the results for global average temperature. On the bottom is the results for um, looking at Arctic sea ice, the extent of Arctic sea ice. And you can see um, how these have been predicting what, would it, what did happen over the last um, just over half century and then um, looking at what might happen into the future um, uh, to the end of the century, and the different colours that you see into the future represent different possible futures in terms of the amount of emissions that we've put into the atmosphere. The key thing that I want you to note here is that in terms of surface temperature, you can see that the uncertainty, the range of the colour, the colour bars that you see associated, shading that you see associated with this is quite narrow. So there's quite high confidence in our future projections of temperature Whereas if you look at Arctic sea ice, that uncertainty is much greater. So there are some aspects of the climate system that we can predict with greater certainty than other aspects. The other key challenge is in terms of understanding, using these, these climate models to understand what's happening at a local level. And that was something that Max um, highlighted as well, because ultimately for decision making, you need to know what's going to be happening in the future at a particular location and um, different climate models often give quite different results, especially in terms of some of the um, variables like rainfall at a local level that diff is difficult. So a challenge, a question is, can we use AI to augment these physics based models, bringing in more data and improving these predictions, reducing the uncertainty in terms of these future predictions. I'm just going to give you two examples of work that we've been doing at the University of Cambridge associated with that. And the first example is around Arctic sea ice, which was one of the aspects that I just showed you um, is uh, one of the challenging aspects of climate models. Arctic sea ice has been showing a really dramatic decline in recent um, decades. And what we have been uh, looking at is whether or not we can produce a forecast system uh, that produces forecasts just for the next six months um, in terms of um, the sea ice extent. And the approach that we've been using is um, akin to looking at using convolutional neural networks, um, uh, akin to, to the way in which image processing um, is, is undertaken. And we essentially take um, uh, images, if you like, of the climate data and put those through um, a convolutional neural network in order to do um, that prediction. Um, and uh, what the prediction specifically is looking at is being able to classify the extent of open water versus marginal ice versus full ice covering the ocean. And um, so we've developed a system um, in order to do that that uh, combines together observational um, data of a, a various different cli climate variables, which we believed to be important in determining the sea ice extent. And uh, we've been able to develop a system using that that has good skill in producing forecasts for the next six months and indeed outperforms um, other more standard approaches. 
Um, and so here you can see um, some results using that forecast, AI-based forecast model that looks at um, not just the um, total extent of the sea ice, but also looks to see whether or not um, the model is putting the sea ice in the right locations um, within the Arctic. And we've uh, got some uh, a recent paper um, in Nature Communications um, that has been published on this. The second example I wanted to give you is slightly different, um, both in terms of what we're looking at and also the approach that we used. Um, so this is where we've been looking at uh, producing predictions of heat waves. Uh, heat waves have particular impact in a whole range of different societally important dimensions. Um, it, a strong heat wave can affect the ability of people to work outside, so it affects labor productivity. Um, it can affect infrastructure. Um, railway lines, for example, if the temperature becomes too high, can literally buckle. Um, and uh, it also affects people's health. And there are literally estimated to be hundreds of thousands of people who die prematurely in heat waves around the world each year. Um, and uh, particularly the elderly are vulnerable to high temperatures. So there's a real need to um, be able to predict the risk of heat waves into the future. And so the goal of what we were trying to do here was to produce city scale projections of extreme temperature. Again, what we were doing was we were looking at how we can utilize the physics-based climate models, but add to them using um, more of the observational data that we have um, and integrate that within a, within a um, um, AI-based approach. What you can see on the bottom left-hand side here is um, an example of the mismatch historically um, between the observational temperatures and the physics-based models. There's a slight offset bias. This is, happens to be Chicago, but I could have looked um, anywhere else and it happens to be um, over the, uh, the summer period, June, July, August. And you can see that both in terms of the average condition, uh, average and also um, some of those extremes that uh, there's an offset between the model, which is shown in uh, red and the actual observations, which is shown in blue. And so one of the key aspects is, can we utilize that observational data to bias correct the um, model, both historically, but then apply that bias correction into the predictions into the future? Um, so that's what we've been doing. Um, because we're particularly interested in looking at the extreme events, then we have to look at approaches that are very, very careful in their treatment of the tails of the distribution. Um, and uh, so we've been um, uh, carefully developing techniques in order to be able to do that. Um, in particular, the um, uh, AI approach that we've been using has used Gaussian processes. Um, in order to do that, in part because we want a really good representation of the uncertainty associated with um, the methods that we're using, coming back to one of the things that Max also um, highlighted. And uh, as with the sea ice forecast, we've been able to demonstrate that this approach has significantly increased skill compared to traditional methods. So just finally, um, and the work that I've uh, shown you so far has been looking at ways of predicting um, meteorological variables, essentially, into the future. So looking at future of sea ice extent or the future um, in terms of the risk of extreme heat waves. But ultimately, for decision makers, you want to understand the next stage, how those impacts then um, affect uh, things that you're actually going to be making decisions on. So how the heat waves um, then create um, risks to whatever operations you're undertaking um, as a business, for example, or um, how they, um, how uh, rainfall um, translates in terms of in, into flood risks or particular assets, or um, more generally, how some of these things interlink and, and connect up to create um, more, more um, the drivers of instability in particular countries, um, how they're networked together and what the risk domino effect risks are associated with that. And so that's the next stage that we're looking at is how we can bring to bear data that is um, representing the vulnerability um, or some of the socioeconomic data that is relevant to determining 
the impacts um, associated with those risks and connecting those, those together with the meteorological risks, again, within an AI framework um, in order to be able to help provide information that directly informs decision making. So I hope that provides a little bit of a summary of some of the things that we're looking at um, at the University of Cambridge um, in terms of the work that we're doing, really growing set of work that we're doing in terms of um, looking at how AI can be used to better quantify climate related risks. Uh, you know, in summary, it's still early days for many of these techniques, but it's quite clear that data driven approaches um, really do um, provide great promise in terms of predictive capability across a very wide range of climate problems. Um, and before I finish, let me just also note that I've talked here exclusively about the use of AI in terms of climate risk prediction, but there's also a huge range of opportunities of using AI in terms of some of the solutions um, to climate change, whether that's in terms of um, helping build digital twins that allow the operation of many different systems in more efficient ways, whether it's about using AI in terms of helping to um, develop greener industrial processes, um, or whether it's simply about um, developing smart systems um, that can be used across a whole range of different industries. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Emily, for your wonderful presentation. I very much like the like your idea of supplementing traditional physics-based climate models. So physics-based models um, naturally are based on mechanistic kind of frameworks where you are trying to understand what, where, where you believe to have an understanding of the uh, mechanistic processes. Um, however, we may not, and probably we certainly do not have a complete understanding of the uh, of all the elements uh, resulting to climate changes, um, and then to use more data-driven, as you said, and predictive um, frameworks uh, such as convolutional neural networks to augment uh, some of those uh, physics-based physics models. Um, I, I'm very much looking forward uh, to have our discussion about uh, the future, the potentials of uh, other let's say, uh, data-driven methods, for example. A lot of phenomena in climate changes are uh, inherently time-series problems. Um, and in more recent years, um, there have been very uh, interesting solutions to time-series problems, for example, for natural language processing. So I was wondering whether one might use a transformer-based uh, methods to understand some of those kind of more complex uh, climate change phenomena, for example. But there might be also fundamental limitations of data-driven methods since they do not really provide a more mechanistic understanding of what really happens. So very much looking forward for the panel discussion. The third speaker um, is, uh, is one of the world experts in using uh, advanced AI techniques for dealing with um, global climate uh, problems. Uh, he's an assistant professor in Canada Sci-Fi AI Chair in the School of Computer Science um, at McGill University and Mila uh, Quebec AI Institute, David Rolnick, I think I forgot to mention your name. And Sci-Fi is, of course, a household name for anyone who does deep learning research. Uh, Sci-Fi 10, Sci-Fi 100 are the standard, so to speak, data repository for many of the classification tasks that people are using in machine learning. Um, he is a co-founder and chair of Climate Change AI and serves as a scientific co-director of sustainability in the digital age. And also, I'm just reading, that uh, he was named uh, by MIT Technology Review in 2021, this year, on the list of 35 inventors under 35 years old. So, great uh, achievement. So, um, we are very glad to have you here, so David Rolnick, and he will be talking about AI and climate change opportunities, challenges, and recommendations. Okay, it's all yours, David. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, there you go. Hopefully, you can see that. Yep, we looks can like, see it. Looks yep. like it's coming through. Uh, fantastic. So um, I'll start out by trying to provide a brief taxonomy of overall themes for how AI can be relevant in helping tackle climate change across mitigation, so reducing greenhouse gas emissions, adaptation, responding to the effects of climate change, and climate science uh, under, understanding uh, the climate better and, and climate change. Obviously, this is a very high level taxonomy. Um, 
if you are not able to pick out every piece of this uh, diagram, that's fine. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, we do have a full 100-page report on tackling climate change with machine learning where we go into these recommendations and more, provide uh, particularly high leverage opportunities and other recommendations for, for how to work on AI in the context of climate change. But I want to talk about overall themes, which really get at some of the, um, the applications that the previous speakers have already discussed and highlighted. And so there are, there are four key themes you can think about in how AI can help tackle climate change. Um, distilling raw data into actionable information. So taking something like satellite imagery and picking out useful information from that, that could be by working out where deforestation is happening in real time, getting better estimates on infrastructure, where coastal flooding is going to affect communities. Um, it could be also uh, natural language processing, parsing large amounts of text to work out, for example, climate relevant information in corporate financial disclosures. And in these cases, really, you have a big data set that a human could maybe go through, but AI can do it much faster and scale that up and provide the kind of insights that are needed to drive decisions, not making the decisions, providing information to drive those decisions. Um, the next overall theme is improving predictions, so time series uh, forecasting, and predictions can be across all kinds of sectors here. We could be looking at uh, demand or supply forecasting to help balance electrical grids, understanding how much electricity is, is uh, being produced by variable sources or how much demand there is uh, for electricity at any given point in time. Having those predictions at a fine level of resolution is really important for balancing the electrical grid. There could also be predictions, for example, for crop yields to avert food insecurity or many other uh, situations. Um, and again, these themes also tie in with what the previous speakers were, were talking about in many different contexts. Um, the third overall theme is optimizing complicated systems. Oftentimes, AI can help optimize and control a complicated system, like an industrial process, so it could use less energy. Um, uh, examples here include um, optimizing heating and cooling systems, uh, so they are more efficient, use less energy, uh, optimizing supply chains, both via uh, optimizing uh, freight uh, routing, uh, optimizing um, things like just scheduling of trains, every, every level here. Um, and then the final, um, the final um, theme that I want to touch on is in accelerating the process of scientific modeling and discovery itself. Um, so this can incorporate both the kinds of things that Emily was talking about in speeding up models of uh, particular pieces of, of climate and weather models, for example, if there's physics that's very time intensive that needs to be, needs to be approximated to make something more computationally efficient or scalable. Um, also includes um, accelerated discovery of materials, for example, so suggestions of what materials should be tried in scientific experimentation to design better catalysts or photovoltaic cells um, or carbon capture sorbents. So many different settings in which one can imagine AI plugging into the scientific discovery process not to replace experimentation, but to augment our intuition to make the process as efficient as possible. Um, okay, so here are some key opportunities for how AI can, can help tackle climate change. W what are the AI technologies? Really lots of different AI methodologies involved in helping tackle climate change. Computer vision is very relevant across lots of different application areas. There are some situations in which NLP can be relevant, many for many applications for reinforcement learning, and lots of other areas of, of AI as well. Um, I want to highlight a few key areas that are really cutting edge within the field uh, of AI and machine learning that are opportunities for, for innovation in climate relevant domains. So where climate relevant problems can help drive fundamental innovations methodologically in AI. Uh, this is sort of aimed at the AI practitioner. There's no reason to be excited about these kinds of problems. So some of the, the opportunities for innovation here are hybrid physical models, incorporating domain constraints into AI methods. As Emily was talking about, there are a lot of situations where we know a lot about the problem. We like to build those constraints and knowledge into the, the, the solutions that we're building. Um, and that's definitely a, a, an area of cutting edge research. Um, transfer learning, so transferring uh, insights uh, from areas, for example, where there is more data uh, to areas where there is less data. Um, Meta-learning can be useful here as well, and this is very important, for, ex for example, in many applications to improve equity, where there are data imbalances between different regions or communities. Uh, interpretable and causal machine learning, Nobody's going to use various kinds of control algorithms for machine learning unless they have an understanding of why those decisions are being made. So really incorporating 
interpretability, understanding why decisions are being made, ideally causality. So actually detecting causal linkages between, uh, between variables can be extremely important in various applications of machine learning and AI to, to climate relevant problems. And then the, the final theme I wanna to touch on here is uncertainty quantification, which is another um, really cutting edge area of AI that is definitely in need of advancement to help push the envelope on what's possible with respect to climate change um, because understanding how unsure models are is also really fundamentally important in um, being able to use them in practice to, to help shape decisions. Okay, so here we've seen overall themes for how I can plug into climate change and where, what kinds of technologies there are. Um, there's some broader considerations. First, AI is not a silver bullet. It's, AI is not magically going to solve climate change and it's not needed everywhere. Um, it's relevant um, in particular situations um, where there are domain specific bottlenecks that are well matched to AI. That is not the case for every climate relevant problem. And in every case, AI is only one piece of the answer. It's not the answer itself. It is something to ex help accelerate other forms of climate action. Second, high impact applications are often not flashy. Um, some of the applications of AI that make the news are not necessarily the applications that are most valuable from a climate perspective. Nobody's necessarily going to, to, to um, be really as excited, excited as a child about predictive maintenance on, on uh, railways, but that's extremely impactful from a, from a climate perspective and, and can be a very interesting AI problem as well. Uh, also very profitable. Many of these high impact applications are also very well aligned with private sector goals, so, so not all of them. Um, even when working with data, sometimes simple methods work. Don't start out thinking that you're going to use transformers. Sometimes regression works. Um, then if the simple methods don't work, then definitely try fancier methods. Uh, it's always good to remember that the, the simplest method that will solve a, the task is the one that one should be using. Um, it's important to remember that AI optimizes for the objectives that it's given. Uh, and it's not a substitute for framing your problem correctly, just because these technologies are powerful. There's all the more reason why one has to be very careful about framing the problem correctly, uh, because it can give you the wrong answer very fast. Um, partnership is the most important thing in any kind of AI for climate uh, application, because interdis interdisciplinary work is really hard. And there are a lot of stakeholders involved in most of these problems and a lot of different goals and incentives that need to be aligned. Uh, partnership between complementary experts is crucial in scoping the right problems, making sure that you're actually solving a problem that is what needs to be solved. Uh, I know that often the field of AI thinks, oh, we can solve somebody else's problems without really understanding what those problems are. Um, incorporating relevant domain information, making sure you're building in what knowledge there is in the, in, in the, in the problem space, and shaping pathways to impact to make sure it's not just in the research space without um, having a real world uh, pathway to, to impact. Um, there are also equity considerations in defining the problems. Are we working on problems that are implicitly defined by the global north, for example? I know wildfires get a lot more attention than locust outbreaks, and both of those should get a lot of attention. They're both really important problems, but wildfires tend to affect North America, Europe, and Australia. Locusts tend to affect East Africa, Middle East, and India. So really thinking about who is defining implicitly what problems get priorities. Um, shaping the solutions, often there are data imbalances. So the solutions that are being built are often implicitly focused on places where there is more data or uh, more um, um, where, where the uh, either regions where there is more data availability or um, communities within those regions where there potentially is, is, is more data availability or, or um, more funding, for example. And empowering stakeholders more broadly to uh, avoid exacerbating digital divides where ideally the, the stakeholders who are helping build these ne this next generation of technologies um, is uh, truly, truly global and truly represents the stakeholders who are affected by climate change and affected by the new technologies. Um, it was mentioned earlier um, that there are positive and negative impacts from AI as regards climate. Here's a quick overview of how that works. Uh, there, I've talked about AI applications and uh, mitigation and adaptation. There are also emissions associated with AI, both via its energy use from computation and also the embodied emissions associated with hardware used to run the AI. And then I also want to mention uh, AI applications that increase emissions, which are 
likely more significant than the direct energy uh, and hardware emissions, so they're not talked about as much. Uh, AI is being used, for example, extensively to accelerate oil and gas exploration and extraction. Um, it's estimated to make about half a trillion dollars for the oil and gas industry, along with other advanced analytics techniques, by 2025 alone. Um, so AI is really being used to accelerate many activities that are not uh, climate beneficial. It's also being used, for example, in recommender systems that are probably increasing global consumption. Um, many ways in which AI is being used both to make climate change better and to make climate change worse, it's, it, it, it it's like a hammer. Depends on how you use that hammer. Um, I think it's important to remember that AI for good isn't a separate area of work. It's a lens to view all AI. I don't like thinking of, you know, well, now we're going to do some positive applications of AI along with all the other applications of AI. No, we can work to align new technologies better with the kind of impact that we want to have in society. And implicit and explicit choices affect that. As an example, autonomous driving technologies can be used both in personal vehicles, self-driving cars, um, and also potentially in other applications like public transportation and freight. And personal vehicles, self-driving cars may end up making climate change worse if they make the barrier to driving lower and end up advancing people driving more. But if we're advancing public transportation and freight, then that might help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So really, the implicit choices we're making in designing a new technology help to shape the ultimate impact from a climate perspective and in general across society. Um, there's a need for better reporting of life cycle emissions associated with, with AI, including importantly scopes one, two, and three. Often tech companies, for example, are very keen to report where their energy is coming from, but not what the AI algorithms are being used to do. We're kind of in danger of building certified, certified green algorithms that are doing not certified green things. Um, so really thinking in terms of uh, scope one, two, and three emissions, what the algorithms are ending up doing. Um, I want to touch on some policy recommendations um, to advance AI for climate. Improving data standards and sharing, offer, often there is very limited data available in some of these cases, not necessarily because the data isn't there, but because it's often uh, held by uh, private actors who don't necessarily have incentives fully aligned for, for sharing, even if it would be beneficial to everybody to, to um, be better sharing data. So designing better data sharing protocols and incentive structures and also standards, because often the data is low quality or inconsistent or hard to work with. I know that basically every practitioner I know uh, has this difficulty where just working with the data is the hardest part of any kind of project. Uh, ensuring impact-driven funding. Often AI funding in particular is driven by methodological advances purely, and we need that, but we also need funding that is driven by the ultimate impact to society to make sure that one isn't just building the, the coolest new algorithms, one's also anchoring them in what is relevant to society. Um, developing cross-sectoral innovation centers um, to help incubate products and facilitate collaboration, make sure that really there is this pipeline to impact from research to deployment. Building capacity and literacy in AI and climate relevant industries, government, civil society, via upskilling, so building AI literacy in people that are already there. And secondment programs, so bringing in people from, from AI to help in, in embedding in within, within relevant, relevant uh, bodies uh, to help ensure that these algorithms can be developed and, and, and deployed and scaled um, in a responsible manner. Uh, establishing best practices for responsible and participatory design, including the needs of all stakeholders. Um, and sharing knowledge across geographic boundaries, um, in addition to, of course, sharing data. That was a lot of information that I was trying to present really fast. If you're interested in diving into more detail on any of this, I highly recommend checking out our report, First Tackling Climate Change with Machine Learning, which provides an overview of lots of opportunities for how machine learning and AI can be applied in the relevant climate, various climate change domains. Um, and also checking out Climate Change and AI, our recent report with the Global Partnership on AI, GPAY, uh, providing recommendations for government action to help facilitate uh, AI for climate work. And I just want to close by mentioning um, the Climate Change AI Initiative, um, which is associated with both of these uh, reports. Um, it, we are an NGO to facilitate impactful work at the intersection of climate change and AI. And if you're interested in finding out more, I highly recommend checking out our resources. We have a global network of experts coming from lots of different sectors, um, provide various forms of information reports uh, webinars, tutorials, and, and so on. Um, we also try to provide resources directly. We just launched a, a grants program to spur innovation uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Um, and uh, we also run events, uh, including one that's happening next week at NeurIPS, which is the biggest uh, AI conference. Um, that should be a few thousand people at this workshop for a day-long program specifically on climate change and AI. 
Uh, with that, I uh, look forward to the discussion, and thank you all for listening. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, David, for your very, very thoughtful uh, presentation. I was most intrigued by your very balanced view of how AI can help climate research, but then also on the other side, how problems of climate research can facilitate um, advancements in AI research. I thought that was very, very in, uh, intriguing, and I'm also very looking forward to the panel discussion as well. Last but not least, um, today's last uh, speaker of this session, as well as uh, of the entire uh, symposium, is going to be Professor uh, Chung Hee Tae. Uh, uh. He's a professor of, in chemical and biomolecular engineering at KAIST and director of um, KAIST Institute for Nanocentury. Um, he leads the KAIST uh, UC Berkeley and Vietnam National University Climate Change Global Research Development Center, and his uh, focus is in understanding or using advanced materials for climate uh, change research. Um, today, he will be giving um, a talk with the title, AI-Driven Nanotechnology Challenges for Climate Warming, as well as uh, following his presentation, um, he will kindly also lead uh, the panel discussion with all the other panel speakers. Uh, Professor Chung, the uh, stage is all yours. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Actually, myself, uh, as a you know, the nanoscientist, I'm working on chemical and the materials. Uh, and uh, for that project, I synthesize new materials for climate change, uh, which is uh, carbon capture and conversion research. And also, uh, I try to organize a climate change institute in KAIST. Actually. Uh, because of their reasons, so not only research, but also I met a lot of different persons who working on very diverse area of the climate change issues. So my questions uh, as a directors of the Kaisenar Institute was that, what r and research can resolve climate change issues? That's one of the, my key issues. And the, then the what we have to do and how to organize of the you know, R&D in KAIST. So I met a lot of people, and uh, so I realized a lot of different aspects of the climate change issues. Okay. So today, uh, I feel like uh, uh, so one of the issues is uh, what AI technology tackle the, you know, the climate change. So eventually, my answer is yes. That's a very, very, very important. So the other questions I, I have. So R&D can resolve climate change issues? My answer is maybe or may, maybe not. However, uh, as the, you know, Emily uh, said just before, so not only AI, AI technologies uh, help us for prediction of the climate change, it helps a lot of the different things for the climate change. Actually, when I meet a lot of people, so everything is calculations. For example, so people try to make uh, one material and uh, try to one system. So usually that, that will be really, really good. However, it also emits a lot of the shared problems. That's uh, we have to very, very complicated calculation is needed. That's why AI is uh, really, really important for our climate change. Okay, so, so actually, uh, when I meet the, just the ordinary people, so they ask me some questions for climate change. So question number one, when will the Earth plane die? I have no idea about that, actually. So next question is, am I okay? Probably my generation is okay. I have no idea about that. But the next generation is really, really problems. So the other question I have usually is, why this happen? This knows, I mean, so average know the, so very no. Yeah. Next question, any solutions? That's my questions today, what I'm going to talk about. And what should I do? 
that uh, uh, the question, most common question I've had from just common, you know, our citizens, peoples. So when the, our Earth plane die, I have no idea about that. But uh, Steve Hawking claimed in his uh, uh, lecture in Oxford University in 2016 that our Earth planet, we have to leave our Earth planet within 1,000 years. And the following year, in its, uh, 2016, uh, from uh, you know interview with the National Geography, said that so we have to leave our beautiful Earth planet within 100 years. That's uh, his uh, really warning to our peoples. So I don't know the, whether the uh, 100 years is our you know, uh, critical limitation or not, but uh, again, it's a really serious warning to us. So am I okay? We are not okay. So as uh, you know, Emily and other people said, we will got a lot of very tough troubles, including flood and the drought and the tsunami. And the uh, sea level is rise. And a lot of the ecosystem change, water shortage. And the uh, human migrations, deforestations, food problem, infections, poverty, crime, economic, stock market, everything is changing. And uh, as you know, uh, it is well known that the emission of the greenhouse gas is uh, the most important and the serious cause, as you know. So greenhouse gases mostly result from fossil energy. We had used it through first, second, third, possibly fourth industrial generation as well. In other words, the use of the fossil energy significantly emitted greenhouse to world, severe effect in the global warming. Even now, the world energy sources are still depending on fossils based uh, fuels, having 27% of coal, 24%, uh, 33% uh, oil, and 24% uh, of natural gas, and 4% uh, of hydroelectric power, 6% uh, uh, of hydroelectric power, and 5% uh, of renewable energies. In other words, almost 84% of the total energy consumption is still based on fossil-based fuels. How to solve? Actually, IEA and IPCC gave clear answers with uh, this very uh, famous BP data. So according to future emission projections, in terms of a scenario from the IEA and the IPCC, in order to maintain the temperature elevation no more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, total shared emissions needed to be reduced something less than 20 giga CO2 uh, tons per year by 2050. Otherwise, global warming will be 60 degrees above pre-industrial levels. This scenario is really disastrous. And uh, in the industrial strategies for global warming viewpoint, they wanted to reduce short emissions by these strategies. To reverse climate change, International strategies rely 32% on the use of the renewable energies and 38% 30, on the energy efficiency improvement and 10% is uh, more, you know, the, uh, actually R&D research breakthroughs. So probably most representative techniques to overcome climate change are many things. For example, as my, myself, as a you know, the nanoscientist, there are also seven nanotechnologies R&D for global warming. 
For example, this includes nanocatalysis and the storage material for CCUS, nanomaterial device for high performance batteries, nanostructure materials, heat insulations, energy efficient, renewable energy nanomaterial for wind blade performance enhancement, and also lightweight composite material for energy efficiency and the nano coatings and nano sensors. And for example, the ma many nano scientists are looking for good material and the system for converting green gases into more useful chemicals. In this area, AI is the most efficient tool to find the best combination materials and the systems. For example, here's copper and the gold element is known as the best materials to convert CO2 into C1 or C2 compound. However, there are tons of different combination of the materials, polyamide material with the coppers. It has been almost impossible to find the best combination of a hetero or a homogeneous polyamide materials. Recently, machine learning techniques made a significant contribution to searching the best material combination for CO2 conversions. Also, you know, artificial photosynthesis is another uh, way for the climate change. According to carbon cycles, about 20% of CO2 in the atmosphere is absorbed and transferred into very useful glucose by plant. They use just light energy and the formation rate for producing glucose is very high with a long-term stability. However, although, you know, uh, Shiacomos insisted that humans will discover the secret of a, a photosynthesis process and the mechanism of plant within 100 years, which is uh, 2012, we still don't know the secret exactly and uh, cannot produce material energy with a greater efficiency than plant in dry desert areas. Very recently, a Harvard group tried to use calcium carbonate aerosol nanomaterials for sun dimming to cool our Earth planets. The group could not test it because of the possible side effect, side environmental and ecosystem change problems. This is uh, AI have to do that to figure out in the R&D viewpoint, he said, in the future, new technology will contribute to Biden, President Biden said, new technology will contribute to reduction of the more than 50% of climate change. Any solution for R&D? R&D plus only hope for global warming, but it is still way long to go. But problem is very limited, time is very, very limited. We still don't know many things yet. So, you know, Emily said that she, she's actually forecasting a lot of the, you know, the climate and the temperature rise theory well, but exactly we still don't know how fast and how severe is the temperature rise and how fast, how severe is the sea level rise, what, how ecosystem will change due to temperature and the sea level rise. So what is the most important approach to prevent the temperature rise? For example, sustainable energy is more important, CCUS technology is more important, or energy efficiency is more important. So in, in the viewpoint of the material, CCUS is important or CCS is important, we don't know. That's all calculation is needed with the help of the you know, machine learning techniques. There are also there are many, many questions, even in the material science. What material combina combination is best for short conversion? So many questions. So finally, I would like to say that the AI can make a con significant contribution to global warming. Thank you. Uh, actually, you know, the moderator uh, just left, and um, uh, I will try to, you know, uh, organize uh, this uh, podium for panel discussions. 
So uh, as we know, the climate change is, uh, you know, uh, the biggest challenge in our planet. Uh, but I think that uh, still we don't know yet how serious it is. So how, the, how it change our life and how to solve the global warming. So the all countries, uh, including uh, developed and the developing countries, uh, seem to agree on the climate crisis uh, from Paris meeting. However, it is also true that the uh, uh, you know, national interests are still big hurdles to responding to the climate crisis. So do you think a uh, uh, goal maintaining temperature below 2 degrees Celsius by 2050 is possible? Is it you know, uh, optimistic or you know, pessimistic? So the, what do you think? So, so please, the, you know, Emily. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I would say that not only um, do we need to be keeping temperatures below two degrees, but really it's becoming increasingly clear from the science that we need to keep them below 1.5 degrees, if at all possible, because there are substantially greater risks um, as you move between 1.5 and 2 degrees of warming. Um, to give you some indication of what some of those risks are, um, it's estimated that several hundred million additional people might be exposed to the risks of climate change and extreme poverty as we move between 1.5 and 2 degrees of warming. It's estimated that between two and three times more plant and animal species will experience severe habitat destruction between 1.5 and 2 degrees. And that's um, at a time in which it's estimated that a million species could go extinct over the coming decades. Um, and the, the, one of the greatest concerns is actually um, from some of the work that I previously did at the British Antarctic Survey, it concerns um, the polar regions and the risk of the vast ice sheets covering Greenland and West Antarctica okay. disintegrating, which yeah. would ultimately lead to many meters of sea level rise. And we know that in the distant past, when temperature has not been much warmer than it is today, that those ice sheets have not always been intact. So again, that difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees could have really dramatic impacts on global society. Um, so, you know, the question is, is it possible to keep temperatures at that um, level below 1.5 degrees? Yes. Uh, you know, currently international pledges are not sufficient in order to do that but they're better than they were. And so progress was made in, in, in Glasgow in terms of the international commitments on emissions reductions. And uh, there was an agreement in Glasgow for countries to come back in a year's time um, to increase the ambition or look to increase the ambition on their pledges. And I think we all have to hope that um, that happens because as I say, the risks of um, increasing temperature are really severe for all of global society. Okay, thank you. So, David, uh, so the one, what are your opinions on this? I completely agree with Emily here, and would also de defer to Emily as uh, as uh, uh, an actual climate scientist. I'm a, I'm a computer scientist. Okay, so Mark. No, no. Similarly, I, I think Emily uh, just put it very well. Uh, that there's an intense risk. Um, in danger, like climactic risk, and not to, to the Earth's environment, like in terms of its habitat and to the people, I think you just put it very well. So it seems like, uh, you know, it's not quite, uh, you know, op optimistic <laughs> for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, you know, um, the, let's assume the uh, global warming will be so 20 degree Celsius above uh, the pre-industrial levels. Uh, obviously, it will change a lot of the, our you know, living life, and also including economics, uh, stock markets, and the food, uh, human migration, ep you know, ecosystems. So what is the most serious significant change for our people, actually? That's quite you know, general questions. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe I can start start with that. So, 
I mean, I, actually, I think this is where some of the research that we've all been outlining um, in terms of better quantifying the risks is really, really important. Um, I don't think we have a full understanding of what the, the extent of those risks are yet. And in part, I think one of the areas where there's significant need for increased research is understanding, you mentioned some of the aspects in terms of the impacts on society in terms of the drivers of conflict or of migration or the way in which risks propagate through global supply chains, for example, um, impacting um, uh, the supply of food, for example, or, or the impact on, on food prices. Um, we've seen some of those um, uh, chains of reaction already happening, but really properly quantifying and understanding those um, risks is critically important. And it's critically important both for understanding the risks to help support um, uh, the appropriate levels of um, uh, emissions reductions, but also understanding the risks in order to build resilience, to look to how we can support countries to adapt to the climate change that will, e will be in store. We're already seeing the impacts of climate change in terms of extreme weather events around the world, as I described. Even if we keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees of warming, we will still see greater climate impacts than we're seeing today. And so we need to understand exactly what those risks are at a local level um, and understand has been emphasized in, by all the speakers, the uncertainty on terms of those future projections in order to inform decision-making. Okay, uh, that, that's quite serious about it. Yeah, so David and Mark, so David, any opinion on that? So, uh and just to compliment Emily's uh, words, um, and particularly in supply chains, um, it's the um, bullwhip effect, uh, which tends to be a uh, increasing, like amplitude of uncertainty as you sort of like as a change in either a demand or a change in supply will trickle through the entire supply chain, and, and sort of like just increase the uncertainty exponentially. Um, so small small changes in, in like food production and food consumption in, in areas that are consuming in food due to migration can like drastically impact uh the, the entire supply chain and our ability to sort of like feed humans uh ju just because um it's not just the magnitude of, of, of the of the change or of the impact but then it gets amplified uh throughout the entire supply chain so, so just wanted to add um, that sort of um, vector of magnification of impact. And okay. very much second what Emily and Max said here. Um, I would also add some other some other ingredients to the to the um, discussion, which is that climate change, like other drastic disruptions uh, to to the world and society, uh, disproportionately impacts already marginalized populations and exacerbates existing inequities. Um, and I um, mean, we've been seeing this with, with COVID, for example, and something else that, that <laughs> may be useful to bear in mind with COVID is that society is generally very bad at understanding exponential growth and understanding that uh, when we're seeing the effects, that is just the tip of the iceberg and the whole iceberg just keeps on getting bigger very, very fast. Um, so, it is very bad that we are starting to see people dying because of climate change. And many, many more will die regardless of what we do now. But we have an opportunity to decide just how bad it's going to be. Um, OK, thank you. Uh, now the time is up. And uh, you know, even though the lots of issues should be uh, discussed uh, more, uh, so we are going to close at this time. We thank you all audience and the panel guests. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your speech, presentations, and discussion. Thank you so much. I think that is, uh, it was a very meaningful discussion about how to use AI technology to cover the climate change. Thank you so much.